Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, switch to our next uh, distinguished speaker. Uh, this one, uh, I think, uh, I think is going to be an amazing talk. So, uh, what what can I say about uh, uh, George? Uh, I've, I've worked with him a long time. George John is uh, co-founder uh, and now chairman of uh, Rocket Fuel. Rocket Fuel is one of the companies that uh, IPO'd uh, two years ago, a year and a half, right. two years ago. Um, Basically, monetizing big data on the advertising world, doing targeting, you'll hear all about that. Um, I met uh, George when he was a student at Stanford, and he asked me to join his uh, PhD committee. Uh, he has worked at Epiphany, uh, one of the big uh, leaders in CRM. Now it's, it's disappeared after going public for a long time. Um, then uh, Salesforce.com, uh, then at, at Yahoo. Uh, and finally, he and his co-founder, uh, Richard Frankel, who were, was also a colleague at Yahoo, uh, started Rocket Fuel. So George is going to share with us his uh, journey uh, through taking it from idea to uh, big business. <laughs> right. so, thank you. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, so my story is uh, kind of one of uh, commercializing KDD. I thought it would be interesting for folks in the audience to hear uh, how a company was really built entirely around this foundation of um, basing a company's operations on autonomous decisioning and autonomous action uh, based on principles that um, we hear about a lot here. Um, I thought I'd ask in the beginning, uh, how many of you uh, from time to time just kind of think about maybe starting a company someday, uh, you know, maybe with some friends of yours in the space? And if your boss is here, just, you know, wink at me, uh, you know. Um, but um, so I guess, you know, I was one of those people. And um, uh, after uh, you know, being at, um, uh, someone mentioned a, a few cool uh, startups that went public, uh, Salesforce.com included, and then uh, doing some really cool things at Yahoo, um, we, we thought we would give it a shot. And I thought I'd just kind of talk through that story and talk about some of the uh, technology pieces of it and also just uh, some of the other aspects of it and, and some of the lessons learned. Um, so the um, uh, agenda is, is, uh, is what you see here, I guess. Um, a little bit fuzzy, but um, I kind of want to give you an introduction to, to myself and the company, talk about what happens just in, in digital media today, um, talk about what we've done with artificial intelligence and big data within rocket fuel, lessons learned, and then uh, um, maybe some other frontiers if we have time in the Q&A. Uh, so uh, the story, um, the um, upper left-hand corner here is actually the uh, first slide of our, our Series A deck when we tried to get rocket fuel funded. It was just sort of clear in 2008 that somebody was going to disrupt online advertising with a far more quantitative approach uh, than uh, had been applied uh, to date. And we had kind of an unfair advantage in seeing that opportunity because uh, at Yahoo, uh, we had been involved, uh, we founders, in looking at a number of the private companies uh, that Yahoo was looking to acquire. We actually thought it would be amazing if we could find a private company uh, that sort of had these kinds of ideas of not just serving an ad, uh, but uh, you know, serving a good one all the time. And the strange thing was, you know, it was damn hard to find that company. And uh, when we realized it didn't exist, we thought, well, heck, you know, uh, this is sort of a rare sign from God, you know, that we should <laughs> we should go do it. Um, so when we started the company, uh, there's uh, three of us. I kind of joke. Uh, Dave Letterman used to have this um, comedy bit: uh, the strong guy, the fat guy, the genius. Uh, there's, you got to have three, and you each have to have your your special role. So for us, it was kind of the the big data guy. That was uh, Abhinav in the uh, luxurious hair. Um, I was kind of the uh, artificial intelligence guy and the guy who sort of managed uh, you know fast scaling teams. And then uh, Richard on the right was the digital marketing guy who had been involved in digital advertising really since the beginning um, at a company called NetGravity and then DoubleClick. And um, we were coming together with uh, a lot of experience around um, you know, satisfying businesses, satisfying marketers uh, with advanced technology. Uh, my own route was kind of weird. I'll mention um, uh, I was actually doing autonomous robotics uh, before getting into uh, sort of more general data mining. And um, it was interesting. You, it, you would get together with other people doing autonomous robots at conferences. And uh, you know, this is in the mid-'90s. And they would say, well, you know, why are we even doing this? Uh, well, you know, someday we're going to send a robot to Mars. And it's going to need to be pretty uh, autonomous because you can't pilot it remotely. And you know, maybe we'll explore some volcanoes. And I think there was one other application. But there were, there were basically three applications we could think of for autonomous robots at the time, one of which involved getting a thing intact to the surface of Mars. And um, it, <laughs> at, at some point, you wonder, you know, boy, other people in their careers, they don't have to bet on that kind of success just for their own piece to kind of uh, you know, engage. And um, around that time, I, was, uh, I had been at Stanford as an undergrad and master's student, but I was uh, wondering where to go for my PhD. And um, I, I got on aboard a, a super shuttle at Stanford around 5 a.m. one day so I could go uh, to CMU. And the, the super shuttle driver asks me, uh, you know, where are you headed? And I said, oh, I'm going to go check out a PhD program somewhere. 
and uh, the PhD, uh, excuse me, the, um, uh, the super shuttle driver turns to me and says, uh, oh, uh, I have a PhD. And, uh, <laughs> and then, then he said, uh, just the only thing that could be uh, you know, more discomforting, uh, he said, that there's a lot of us here at Super Shuttle with PhDs. And not, not that there's anything wrong with you know, being of service to the world by ferrying people about. It's important. You know, we need that. But um, it, it wasn't what I had in mind, is, you know, the, the outcome of, uh, of all that work. So um, uh, that summer, I had been working at NASA. And um, uh, there was a guy there named Peter Cheeseman, who some of you may know the autoclass algorithm from it's uh, sort of an oldie but goodie uh, from the mid-90s, uh, unsupervised learning algorithm. Uh, Peter said, you know, you really ought to get into this data mining thing uh, because it's, it's really going to be big. So uh, that was kind of uh, uh, my push. And then I uh, worked in um, uh, actually consulting, but weirdly as part of Lockheed Missiles in Space. Uh, it was one of those uh, beating our swords into plowshares kind of moments where instead of launching missiles to blow things up, they thought, what if we could launch coupons at just the right people to make them buy Miracle Whip? And so that was actually, while working at Lockheed Missiles in Space, that was one of my customers' craft and we were trying to help them sell more Miracle Whip. And uh, basically, as part of that process, I just d discovered that you can sort of always be the hero uh, by being the person, sort of the, you know, the data scientist coming in and analyzing marketing data. And so that's really what I've been focused on uh, for a number of years now. Um, so at Rocket Fuel, this is a bit of a braggy slide. Uh, I, I, I put this one in just so um, uh, if I'm kind of mentioning lessons learned, you kind of understand a little bit of context. So, so we started Rocket Fuel in uh, early 2008. I uh, went public in September of 2013, and right now we have about 1,000 employees, and uh, we're doing about half a billion in revenue a year. And um, we're serving uh, almost all major advertisers um, in the US, uh, 96 of the top 100, and then increasingly more around the world as we expand. And um, the, uh, one, one of the, the fun things was um, there's, there's a lot of uh, kind of um, you know, squishy things. So you, you can say these sorts of things, and you wonder, well, does everybody do that? Who knows? Uh, but uh, one of the things I'm, I'm very proud of is uh, uh, Deloitte, actually, the accounting firm, does a, uh, a, an audit every year just to look at company growth rates. And uh, Rocket Fuel was actually the fastest growing company uh, in 2013. Um, so, so a lot of good things have happened. And I think a, a lot of it really did have to do with the kind of things we talk about here at this conference. Um, uh, the you know there's just so much potential, so much um, uh, you know you, you call it waste or inefficiency you know or opportunities for optimization in business and life, uh, even cattle farming apparently. Um, so that uh, you know the kinds of things we work on can be just heroic for, and uh, I think this is really a story not just of this one company but just of applying ideas uh, that we explore here at KDD. Um, by the way, in terms of commercial applications, uh, Usama didn't mention, but. Um, uh, during my uh, grad studies, when I was worried, you know, is what I'm going, is what I'm working on going to be a value? Uh, Usama was actually the first person to ever offer me a job uh, back in 1992 at the uh, machine learning conference, uh, based on what I was doing. By the way, the bottom here, I just have a. Um, there's statistics that are nice, but um, the, the bottom is a tweet from one of our customers who was saying uh, she was actually watching her campaign learn just by looking at Google Analytics and seeing the results from Rocket Fuel. Uh, get better and better over time. Hashtag uh, creepy awesome. Uh, I presented that tweet at a conference, and a woman came up at the end and said, "I'm I'm that lady." And it was funny. She's uh, we talk about our culture at Rocketfield being nerdy but lovable, and she's actually the head of marketing for a dinosaur museum in New Jersey. So fits the um, fits the prototype there. Um, uh, one final brag on the Deloitte uh, numbers. I, I was I, I got interested since we were number one to see who else had been number one, and it turns out uh, the last six years. Um, the only company that grew faster than us is Tesla, um, so I'm okay. You know, Elon Musk is a pretty cool guy, so I'm, I'm okay being number two to Elon. So, um, so I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about what we do and, uh, in, in programmatic marketing at Rocket Fuel. And to do that, I'm going to show you um, uh, a little um, uh, kind of uh, what's called a Prezi uh, that uh, goes through how digital media works today. So um, here's a guy. Let's call him Bob. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, let's call him Bob, and um, you know he's trying to uh, view a web page on his computer. Uh, this example is going to talk about a web page, but it, you know mobile apps, uh, online uh, video, they all kind of have the same uh, uh, the same sort of um, uh, cycle to them. So uh, you know his browser sends a page request to the New York Times server, sends back a page. Um, you know browser starts rendering that page, and so there's the content, but then um, you know, there's these boxes that the ads are supposed to go in, right? So uh, these days, a lot of that space is auctioned off in real time as these pages are being consumed. And so the New York Times ad server might have sent back, you know, a little bit of code that says, go get the ad from somewhere else, um, such as um, you know, one of the ad exchanges. So a number of companies operate these real-time ad exchanges. So uh, the browser in real time might request ads from that exchange, and it might pass along certain data about the context of, that the ad's going to be shown, the anonymous user ID, the URL it's on, and so forth. So then the exchange uh, conducts an auction in real time 
Um, our engineer who built this uh, is actually fond of the uh, Silicon Valley show. So this is, uh, uh, there's, it's not Rocket Fuel and Huli and Pied Piper. It would be other companies um, that uh, we're fighting against to win, but let's just say for now. Um, so uh, a bunch of companies that try to advertise are, are going to get that bid request. And, and the, the bid request is basically, you know, here's a chance to buy an ad spot. You know, what do you want to bid? By the way, get back to me in 100 milliseconds. That's when the auction window closes. So, so then uh, we get this type of opportunity uh, about 84 billion times a day right now uh, to buy one little slice of human attention somewhere around the planet. And uh, so our bidder kicks in. Uh, the bidder, of course, needs to look up uh, from that request context. There's some anonymous user ID. Uh, we have an online store uh, in HBase that stores about on the order of 20 billion uh, profiles on devices, uh, which um, you know sort of uh, merges into um, uh, somewhere in the one plus billion number of actual humans. Um, so we'll look at that online store to see, well, what do we know about this user? Um, so uh, we look that up. Let's just say there's uh, some demographics. We might uh, have inferences about uh, age. Uh, we might have uh, third party data suggesting interest in, in different commercial activities, like buying a car. Uh, we will have observed this user directly via our presence on the web, uh, let's say buying a pizza or um, uh, maybe shopping at JCPenney. And uh, we might know that their interests uh, lie in the arts, just again from uh, having a chance to uh, see um, what's happening online. Again, we don't know who they are, but we know somebody out there seems to have these interests and use this device that the ad is being shown to you now. So now you've got that profile looked up, and now you can look through all the campaigns. There's thousands of campaigns, uh, tens of thousands of ads. Um, they need to be sorted through very efficiently to understand which ones we really need to go to the trouble of scoring, right, computationally. Uh, once you've got that, there's a model for each one, a scoring model that sort of you can uh, imagine, right, having different factors for all these different variables. Um, people always ask what it is, and we, we say it's in the family of generalized additive models, but we don't say much more than that. And so each one of these campaigns has its own model and gets scored. That results in um, uh, some ad being chosen uh, to, to go back as, you know, the ad we're going to bid on. And um, there's a process that we never talk about too much, which takes that ad's propensity score, that is the, re the response score, and uh, incorporates other factors like, well, did that company who we're serving that ad for, did they want us to serve you know, a million, 100 million ads today? You know, how, how hard are we trying to serve this ad? And also, how well are we doing against their performance objectives? Um, all those things uh, go into the final uh, dollar economic bid that we want to uh, give. So that's what we say back to the auction. Um, uh, here's, here's the ad. Uh, let's say this one was JCPenney, and we want to bid $2.71 CPM. Uh, that's cost or, or cents per mil, so it's, it's really, um, uh, this would be 0 0.2 pennies um, that we're building, bidding right now. So all that computation just happened uh, to make an offer to pay 0.27 pennies. Um, you know, win rate is maybe 1%, so <laughs> really it's uh, like 0 0.002 pennies uh, that, that are likely to be spent as, as a result of all that computation. Um, so after that, a few things happen. Logging occurs. Um, you know, there's obviously a, a control UI that um, describes what the advertiser goals are for all these different campaigns. And um, you know, after uh, seeing the ad, uh, the person may or may not actually take the desired action. In this case, that might be going to the JCPenney store and buying something. And then those ads, uh, you know, uh, appear on the page. So it's tremendous. Um, you know, if you've ever seen Tron, uh, there's this game of Tron being played uh, many times for every single page you're consuming uh, online right now. So in that environment, you can imagine, though, it's, it's almost like uh, media all of a sudden lit up like NASDAQ did, right? All of a sudden, there's this opportunity to plug <laughs> machines into it and achieve far superior results uh, for marketers. So and that's what we try to do at Rocket Fuel. Um, so the, um, you know, the history in marketing, it's, um, uh, when you look at it from a data mining lens, uh, it's pretty limited, right? Uh, marketers tend to think about uh, you know, a handful of segments. There's maybe my high income segment or my uh, frequent shopper segment or things like that. And it's valuable for them to think that way as they're thinking about strategy and the creative or the ads or the messages they're going to show, right? You might say a different thing to a frequent shopper versus maybe a high income person but who's never been to your store yet. Um, so that's, that's a, a lovely way to think about the messaging. But then once you've got the message, there's no reason to constrain right, the, the delivery, uh, sort of the scoring function that describes uh, every single uh, little bit of human attention that's viable on planet Earth today. There's no reason to only think of that in, in 12 segments or whatever the, the, the marketer's uh, list was, right? Um, so these segments are, are too broad. And even at the individual level, so let's say, okay, never mind about uh, segments. Let's, let's try to score individuals. I mean, even individuals, they're, they're in different mindsets at different times of the day. They're on different devices. Uh, they're just thinking about different things. So again, why would even one person sort of be the same? You treat them differently uh, during a day. So 
um, you know, you can imagine the, the kinds of uh, technologies we work on. I mean, if you can have a scoring function that's cognizant of these things, right? It can be cognizant of uh, not just uh, the person, let's say, but the device they're on, where they're at geographically at this moment, uh, you know, what uh, content they're reading. Um, you might as well just slam those things all in as features, right? And have the machine learning system uh, do some regularization. Maybe some of those features uh, drop out, but at least there's an opportunity to search for patterns in this high dimensional space. And so that's what we do. And, and as we try to talk about it with marketers, we, we, we talk about uh, marketing in the moment, right? So you're thinking about not just a person, but uh, what's on their mind at that time, uh, kissing the soccer ball or kissing, uh, kissing his own child, presumably. Uh, probably that's a stock. You know about stock photography? That's a stock baby. It's, uh, his career is just uh, being in, in stock ads. But um, so, so how does that work? Um, well, so uh, there's a few pieces to it. So one is uh, this idea of moment scoring. So actually applying these scoring functions uh, in real time 80 billion plus times a day um, is marketing that learns, right? So as this is happening, uh, there's no reason why would you ignore what you just learned, right? If uh, in the past hour you've served this ad a million times, uh, it worked 50 times and didn't work <laughs> the remaining 999,950, um, learn from that, right? Uh, so continuously be applying uh, machine learning training algorithms on this data. And then uh, magnifying the moment is just what we call uh, the process that we're always going through of trying to understand what other dimensions we can add to the overall process, which is maybe not just uh, real-time uh, uh, features, let's say, but uh, you know, roll-up or constructive features that um, uh, describe uh, the history uh, with a, a person over time. So um, you know, with moment scoring then, so you've got different, uh, excuse me, different uh, uh, messages that are gonna apply uh, or, or be scored differently at different times of the day. Um, I won't go through, through all the details here, but. Um, and, uh, and this is sort of uh, impactful then, the, 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 a the aspect of, uh, of learning over time. Most of the time when marketers um, you know, run a campaign, uh, they're used to um, spending a ton of time planning. You know, uh, they think a lot and think a lot about who they're gonna try to target with the ad, um, where you might find those people, is it on this magazine or that magazine or this website or that uh, video, and, um, and then they launch it. And then, and then after launching, it's like it's done. Um, now they're on to thinking about the next thing, but, but as machine learning people, right, that after launch, that's just when it starts, right? <laughs> that's when you uh, begin to uh, show the ad, that's when you begin to get the response data back. So uh, w with Rocket Field and uh, machine learning like system, right, um, uh, over time as a campaign is running, uh, results are changing. So th the, uh, the blue line uh, kind of coming down here is showing a, a declining cost per action. That's good. So this is actually, uh, this was a real campaign. This is uh, getting someone to sign up for an online service where they pay $100 a year for a subscription to the service. So the action is actually getting your credit card out and, and signing up. Uh, $90 cost per action would have meant, uh, you know, for every sign up, it cost them $90 based on the uh, media we were running and getting down to um, the, the five to $10 range. Uh, that's awesome, right? For them, it, if it costs $100 and it only costs you $10 to sign someone up, that's, that's a good day. So over time, uh, the system by itself uh, just improved and improved and improved. There's no human intervention um, you know, in any campaign. Uh, you know, the machine learning PhDs, they're working on you know, the general algorithms that run all of these campaigns, but we don't really uh, look into any particular campaign to make it smarter. We just let it do that by itself. Uh, the getting smarter part is uh, the green line there. So the green line is showing the number of features that are surviving regularization uh, for this model. So in the beginning, uh, there's no campaign-specific model. We just started, right? Uh, there, there's general features that describe, uh, for example, we might know that uh, certain websites are, are uh, fraught with a lot of fraud, a lot of bot traffic, so we don't buy those. Uh, we have um, algorithms that describe maybe uh, response rates at different times of day. So there's only uh, these sorts of basic, um, uh, you know, this sort of basic knowledge that's in there in the beginning. And then the system has to learn. So over time, as it learns, uh, you know, the performance gets better, and uh, you can't see at all <laughs> what's in the, uh, uh, the feature section there, but just uh, as examples to, uh, to point out, there's um, uh, one feature is just um, uh, whether they actually ever looked at a product page on this one advertiser's website. Um, there's cities that it likes. It likes Atlanta, it likes Tampa, uh, doesn't like certain other uh, cities and DMAs, um, uh, doesn't like Los Angeles <laughs> for whatever reason, uh, doesn't like people who live in apartments. This happened to be a home services uh, type of product. Um, uh, and um, uh, let's see, likes people who've played online games and uh, made luxury retail purchases and searched for luxury uh, products. So generally, uh, those are the kind of things there that are, um, that are being learned over time. And um, the way we end up uh, you know, working with customers is, um, it's funny, uh, marketers always, um, uh, to, to Renny's talk in the morning, I guess, they, there's always some, uh, maybe it's not the highest paid person, but it's maybe the most experienced person who's done you know, a lot of the campaigns in the past. They always come in uh, saying, well, I know who my customers are, you know, it's, it, it's these people, go target these people. And we always have to say, boy, could you let us just give it a try? Because you never know, right? <laughs> and um, we've had, um, 
Interesting. We had a, we had one insurance company that demanded that we run the, their ad only on weekdays because they they had learned that weekends are not a good time, and we thought, wow, you know, um, I, I'm sure there can be different numbers of uh, you know degrees of, of uh, intensity of serving this campaign. So the weekend might be less than a weekday, but it, how can zero? <laughs> how, what are the odds that zero is the optimal number of ads to serve on the weekend? So um, uh, we've had a, a lot of uh, occasions to kind of uh, go back and forth and just kind of challenge people's assumptions a little bit and say, look, let's, it's just data, right? If it, uh, let's just try, and um, uh, it's it's pretty rare uh, that preconceptions actually hold. Um, sometimes there were you know there was some sort of correlation with some other variable that may have been really driving, but it wasn't really the uh, the preconception uh, that uh, that was yielding the value. Um, I don't know one other story. We had a department store that wanted us to run their campaign, but only in cities that actually have one of their physical department stores. But the goal of that one campaign was actually online sales, and we said, well. You know, you can actually get to the website from anywhere. <laughs> so uh, maybe we could just try. You know, and uh, it worked worked beautifully um, to uh, to do that. So so that's kind of the uh, the main thing that uh, customers are seeing uh, is this sort of just rational uh, improvements in results over time. Um, not all customers uh, are, uh, are sort of are as rational as you might think. So you might think as a marketer, um, you know, if I'm selling toothpaste, let's say. Uh, you know, I would just think of my job as well. You know, how much money did I spend trying to tell people about how lovely my toothpaste is, and then how much toothpaste did I sell? And then you divide, you know, the sales by the marketing spend, and you're happy if that's kind of getting better over time. Um, we actually went. I was personally part of this one meeting. Uh, we went to talk to the head of media buying for a toothpaste company, and uh, we explained how awesome this is and how you could really measure. I haven't gotten into the measurement part, but you can actually measure some offline sales data with partnerships like Nielsen. And we said, isn't this great? Now you can actually measure your toothpaste sales. And he, he kind of just leaned back and looked at the ceiling and said, you know, how excited can I get about selling one more tube of toothpaste? And we thought, wow, uh, a lot, right? That's, <laughs> that's, that's all you do. And um, so I, I think um, you, know, you have to have some sympathy, right? I think it's sort of like uh, um, if you've lived in this world for so long where you couldn't measure, you know, and even if you could measure a little bit, you didn't have enough, you know, there's not enough sort of uh, steering wheels or knobs or whatever. You know, to really kind of get better at it over time, so you, you become satisfied with um, you know delivering the campaign and being you know having good placements, you know being on the third page of Good Housekeeping or whatever the the right uh, outlet is, and so um, it, it takes a, a t some time, right, for people's uh, um, uh, conceptions to kind of change. Um, so what happens then with this moment screen? This is a heat map of all of the impressions we bought uh, for this online services campaign. Um, the x-axis there is logarithmic, so it's going from 10 to the negative 4 to 1%. Uh, that's the score, uh, the likelihood of response at the time we were buying that space for the advertiser. And then the y-axis is what we had to pay in the auction. And so the little blue lines are sort of ISO CPA lines. And that's if, if the campaign were sort of uh, rational, right, you would kind of expect all the impressions to lie on one of those ISO CPA lines. That is sort of the, you know, the better the quality of the impression, the more we were willing to pay for it. Um, and that's what you see kind of for the maybe the right two-thirds part of it. Just focusing on that part for a minute, uh, so on the x-axis there, 1% and, and better than 1%, that's incredibly high for an online ad. That, so, so the context here is you're just seeing this little rectangle off to the side, right? Well, you're, you're trying to read your newspaper ad or whatever, uh, excuse me, your, your news content. Uh, the ad's just off in the corner, and the system is predicting it has a 1% chance of getting you to actually sign up for this service uh, after seeing that ad. That's incredibly high, and so for those impressions, the system was actually paying up to $100, uh, even 200 um, it goes further up that uh, got clipped there. Um, so that's an incredibly high price to pay, but the, the system was happy to do it. Um, on the lower hand side, you're seeing like a kind of a lot of uh, blob there <laughs> on the uh, lower end of, uh, of the response prediction um, uh, axis. And you, we, we wonder, well, wait, why, is it, why is it doing that? It doesn't seem right, right? Um, and it turns out that the way a lot of advertisers want to buy isn't really rational if they have just a pure uh, cost per action goal, because they always say, uh, here's my budget, uh, here's my target cost per action, but also deliver uh, you know, 50 million ads a day uh, for this campaign. And, uh, and they'll want us to charge them on a CPM basis. That's basically charging them every uh, time we deliver an ad, not every time we deliver a result. So you can imagine then if the, if the price uh, based on the volume that you're delivering uh, is too high, you end up having to balance the campaign with uh, you know, you're buying $200 good stuff, then you have to buy some cheap stuff just to balance it all out uh, with what they paid. In the end, you can fix this just by either delivering less or, or shifting up the average price. Uh, we actually did, and it, it actually got better. That was an interesting conversation to have with the customer. If only you'll pay me uh, more. <laughs> I can give you better results, but it was uh, true based on this. So um, you learn fun things. So I mentioned some things about uh, simple, simple day of week and uh, geography. This was a fun one. Uh, we were looking at um, uh, a blend of a few luxury car campaigns. And just wondering, uh, 
you know, what are the websites that seem to you know do well for luxury car campaigns? Um, so we did a word cloud. Big and blue means uh, very high positive coefficient or you know weights in the model. Uh, big and gray means very high negative coefficient, and we tried to blur those out. I didn't want to embarrass any uh, website owners, but. Uh, the, the weird thing is, so um, you know, among the big and blue websites, um, the biggest one is start.toshiba.com, which has nothing to do with car sales, right? It's just if you happen to buy a Toshiba laptop and you don't have the energy to change the default start page, every time you begin browsing the web, you begin at start.toshiba.com, and the system just figured out that it was, uh, it was easy to sort of distract people who hadn't gotten into anything anyway, uh, easy to distract them with an advertising experience. Um, so... The, um, on the left here, you see Mac Rumors and Apple Insider, and those kind of make sense to me. I think you know, if, if you're just waiting to give more money to Apple uh, for their expensive gadgetry, you're probably a good prospect for BMW or, or Lexus or, or whatnot. Um, and then uh, here's an obvious one, LexusEnthusiast.com. Okay, you know, now you're waiting to give Lexus your money, so obviously a good prospect. Over here, there's NDTV.com and the uh, Hindustan Times. Some, uh, many of you know, I mean, so NDTV is uh, New Delhi TV. It's uh, one of the major news sites uh, from India. But this campaign was only targeted at users who were in the U.S. at the time. So basically what the system discovered was an audience of Indian expatriates living in the U.S. Uh, who were well qualified to uh, purchase luxury cars, apparently. And one of the reasons I love this story is um, uh, it sort of uh, it played out in real life. I, I drive a uh, slightly beat up Prius. I was uh, leaving our parking lot one day at Rocket Fuel and up next to me in his brand new Mercedes pulls Abhijit, our head of uh, data platforms. <laughs> so um, Abhijit was in this, uh, in this little segment somewhere. Um, so, and that's just one dimension, of course. And, and of course, the, the scoring, uh, the full model, it's, it's very hard to visualize, right? It's uh, blending all these features uh, together, uh, some of them you know, in combinations, of course. Uh, so it, it's hard to visualize the whole thing, but you know, this is blending with a bunch of other factors. It's not like the system would just buy anything on these websites. It's only still if uh, there's other factors that are that are useful. And uh, around those other factors, so that's what the, the people do, right? Is, so you're, um, this machine is running all the time with the, the features that are eligible for the models right now, doing its regularization to see what survives each time it learns. And then uh, you know, what we're doing as people is looking at these things saying, hmm, you know, what, what else can we give it uh, to work on, right? Um, are there other things that are available in the data now? For example, maybe different partners um, uh, begin at different times to be able to share uh, more granular location data with us. Um, there was a question on regulation earlier, actually, uh, based on privacy, right, uh, certain granularities of, of location are now viewed as actually privacy infringing. So sometimes the humans go and you know, bash it in the brain <laughs> and make it a little bit stupider because we're not allowed to look at some of that stuff. So sometimes you pull it back. But uh, generally, there's, um, generally the ball moves forward here in terms of trying to think about how you can look at uh, the data that we're getting to build more features um, uh, that drive uh, results and then A-B test them. A-B testing is interesting for us. So um, uh, you know, what that means is having sort of algorithm A versus algorithm B uh, both running on uh, maybe all campaigns, trying to see, you know, is one of them, uh, you know, better enough, almost like, uh, you know, is this new drug uh, better at treating some sort of, um, some illness? So there's a ton of A-B testing. We used to do um, uh, back testing, uh, but we found um, it's very hard to back test and actually get uh, directional results. So we, we t tend to live test right now. So this works uh, very nicely. There's a, a ton of uh, case studies and, um, and customers. And the approach with AI lets us do really any kind of campaign. It doesn't have to just be you know, signing up for things doesn't have to just be on, on the laptop, can be on a mobile app, et cetera. Um, I threw in this one example just to talk about branding, because sometimes people think, well, how do, you know, uh, in this case, brownie mix. <laughs> so uh, how are you going to market brownie mix? Because you don't actually buy that stuff online. But uh, you can do things online, like, um, you know, ask survey questions that are, are designed to sort of sniff out the right audience, show the ads at that audience, and then measure offline sales. Um, these offline sales uh, charts are pretty cool, because you can literally measure the difference between the exposed and control audience. Uh, in terms of their offline sales and just see how they buy the same amount over time. And then as soon as the campaign starts, the, the audience that you're exposing to the campaign uh, begins to buy more of, of what you wanted them to buy. Um, that one always makes me think of this Dilbert joke uh, where uh, he says, uh, you know, marketing only is only legal because it doesn't work. Um, so, <laughs> you know, with uh, planet scale computation, right, it's, um, it's, it actually does, uh, does work. Um, I won't get into details, but there's a fair amount of dealing with bad guys. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, kind of weird stuff on the net, a lot of bot traffic, I think. Uh, I may have heard from the morning speaker on um, you know, bot traffic on, um, on Microsoft sites. And so uh, it, it takes a lot of energy just to, um, to stay ahead of them. Um, with, um, with Rocket Fuel, I think one thing we've noticed then is um, uh, if this works, sort of in trying to say the right thing across the whole web, um, then why can't you also say the same thing on your own website, right? So if we're working with a bank trying to you know, get them new customers uh, on random websites, New Delhi TV, wh whatever it may be, uh, can't we also, when they're on you know, that bank's own website, 
uh, be personalizing offers based on the information that that bank knew. And so what we do now through uh, uh, our, what's now called a data management platform uh, that allows real-time decisioning on websites, mobile apps, and others. So you can begin to have this sort of intelligent conversation uh, you know, through all the different uh, channels that um, you speak. So I'm excited about this. Uh, you know, uh, Ronnie and I were actually together at uh, Stanford, and um, you know, there, there were a lot of big dreams about what AI would do, and um, it's really starting to kind of blend into uh, uh, life in a lot of ways. I, I felt like um, you know, if, if you're really solving AI uh, to some degree, you're really solving some problem with AI, rather, um, in addition to just results, you should hear something more emphatic, right? Uh, you should hear people say, this gives me more time to spend with my wife and young family, or I can actually go home before it's dark out and maybe get in a run, right? So uh, we do hear that kind of thing uh, from our customers. And I think it's, it's kind of cool because, um, uh, you know, if you think about automation, right, there's a lot of software that calls itself something or other automation. Uh, like I was at Salesforce, and it's a, it's a nice company, but uh, it's Salesforce automation in the sense that it's really automating kind of the paper record keeping of human salespeople's activity. It's not like Salesforce builds little robots that go out and sell your products for you, right? And um, it's, it's, um, the, the system is, is not that smart, but you know, what we're doing, what Amazon does, um, is really picking up uh, things to a, a new level that I, I think is going to become much more common uh, in business. So, um, so there, uh, on this point of uh, automation and sort of business and healthcare as well, um, I don't know if any of you have seen, uh, Johnson & Johnson has this uh, set assist robot that actually doesn't assist uh, an anesthesiologist, but it actually replaces them in a certain class of operations. Um, I think it may not be that hard. Uh, as I understand anesthesiology, if the patient starts to die, you give them less, and if they say, ow, 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 you, you give them more. And so I, um, but, <laughs> but um, so, so I think uh, even, even doctors are kind of worried. And so, you know, based on what we're doing, I think, you know, question is, are data scientists out of a job too? And I don't think so, right? There's just always more to study. Um, you know, for us, the systems are kind of handling the basics of, you know, deliver the brand campaign, deliver the, the direct response or sales oriented campaign. There's always more to look at to try to figure out um, well, wait a minute, what if we think about this in a more holistic way? What if we change our strategy? Um, so humans are still finding ways to get, you know, many times uh, better results uh, by changing strategy on top of the machines optimizing the tactics. Um, behind this, um, uh, there, it's, um, you know, seriously uh, large-scale data. So we've got about 200 terabytes a day adding into a 68 petabyte uh, warehouse that we sort of keep scattered about the surface of the planet. Uh, we have similar issues to NASDAQ trading, I guess, right, in this advertising world. Uh, you have to co-locate near the exchange so you can spend as much time as possible thinking about what to say versus uh, waiting for uh, light speed uh, signals to travel somewhat slowly across the circumference of the planet. Um, so um, uh, we've been fairly bleeding edge adopters of um, Hadoop, HBase, Kafka, uh, Yarn, and, uh, and Spark, and a lot of growth just in the last uh, few years in terms of the scale uh, that we operate at. Um, let's see. So um, I'm at 31. I was thinking I had 45 minutes. I'm only at 31. Can I have just a... Okay, oh, two. Yeah, so generous. All right, uh, cool patterns. Um, I'll just mention this one. We, we just released a story today on, um, uh, for example, people who uh, say they're in favor of gay marriage uh, read books, and uh, people who are against it go to church. Uh, people who are pro-choice, they run and drink wine, and people who are anti-choice, they watch game shows and eat candy. Um, <laughs> so um, so uh, lessons learned. Um, I will, uh, I'll talk about uh, maybe just a, a few. Um, uh, one key one that I think uh, worked for us is uh, optimizing the speed of learning. There's a lot of different ways of trying to uh, provide uh, technology to the world. And um, uh, for us, we chose to kind of be principals in this market of advertising. That is just to go uh, talk to advertisers, uh, you know, take their money and be responsible for spending it well for them and, and serving them as well. And we did that as opposed to just kind of selling software to other people who would have that job because we just thought we would learn more, you know, by kind of uh, actually being uh, soldiers versus just sort of being arms dealers, right? Um, the um, uh, one is uh, uh, on uh, starting a company, I would say. Another is uh, maybe um, diagnose everything. Uh, it's incredible the number of times people come and they say, uh, this thing, you know, went this way because X. And um, it's, just, it's just never, that's just never the story, <laughs> the whole story. You just have to dig and dig and try to understand really what's going on. Um, I'll say in terms of applying advanced tech, um, be bold. I, I think it was funny. Uh, my, my, my point there is if people tell you it's too hard, um, that's a good sign. You know, keep, keep going. Because... Um, uh, we had uh, Rajiv Matwani uh, on our advisory board at the beginning. I just, one of the funnest uh, presentations was when we were walking him through what we were trying to do. And uh, he stopped us in the middle and said, you know, that's, that's hard. <laughs> and we're like, yeah, we know, but uh, it's going to be cool if it works. So I think there's, there's just a lot of temptations to uh, compromise. And um, I think, uh, you know, to automate a piece of a project, but not all of it, you know, just let a human wake up and deal with things. And I think um, that's, just, that's just not the awesome way to do it. You know, if, uh, if you can really fully automate the thing where you never have to poke a human and say, oh, no, 
uh, you know, stall, stall, if you've, uh, you know, read anything about uh, different, uh, you know, accidents that relate to only semi-automating uh, air uh, travel and uh, uh, piloting airplanes, for example, um, better to automate the thing all the way. So there's a really good talk by Astro Teller uh, at Google from South by Southwest, um, I think it was earlier this year, about fully automating. Um, I may mention as well, uh, crossing the chasm, this, this idea of um, uh, if, you're, if you're doing something commercial, trying to find rational customers, it's a silly thing to say, but there's just a lot of uh, places in the world where there's such entrenched uh, you know, in buying styles, maybe in medicine, there's so much regulation, uh, right? So if you can find areas where people are forward leaning into innovation, which marketing is, right? If you, if you talk to ad agencies, they're always under pressure to find the new thing for their client. Uh, so if you can bring them a new thing that they can test and then just rationally measure, well, I sell more cars, you know, when I run ads on rocket fuel than when I run ads on the other thing, uh, then it's a good way to cross this chasm that people talk about between, you know, just having early adopters and having a more mainstream application. Um, I'll mention on AI, um, Asimov, uh, in his books, talked about robot psychology being the uh, profession of the future. He's totally right. Uh, you know, when you have, when you have a number of uh, semi-independent autonomous processes running and spending, you know, a, a million dollars a day, um, odd things happen from time to time. And uh, the process of diagnosing that, um, it, it is sort of this weird sort of psychosis or neurosis that you can almost uh, label um, some of their actions. And uh, this, this why is it doing that, right, this um, uh, can be very interesting to try to um, uh, dig into. So um, uh, with that, I'll just say um, uh, I'm proud to have uh, created a company that uh, so many people, obviously it's not just me, a uh, thousand employees and tons of partners around the world. And uh, it being the last of The Daily Shows uh, just a few days ago, I thought I'd say proud to have uh, sponsored The Daily Show in all, our small way. Uh, this is actually a screenshot. Of, um, this one's awesome to me. It's uh, Morgan Freeman explaining the multiverse theory to John Stewart uh, while in the corner, Rocket Fuel was trying to get me to go to the gym and uh, lose some weight. So with that, I will, I will stop. George, hopefully we have a microphone floating around, so we do have time for uh, one or two quick questions. All right, way back there. Can you make it? Why don't, you, why don't we start over here with the uh, microphone, and then you get the, your turn. Thank you. So you talked about the stringent latency requirement. You have like you have to answer a request within 100 milliseconds, and at the same time, you're also talking about model complexity. So I guess there is a good trade-off probably between model complexity and meeting the latency requirement. I was wondering <laughs> if you can share some, uh, if you can share something about how you deal with this challenge in that area. Uh, boy, uh, lots of caching um, of different things, right? You can actually, uh, certain things don't change maybe for a certain user between one request and the next. Um, so a lot of opportunities uh, there. And um, there's a lot of just sort of general um, high availability uh, computing um, we have uh, some PhDs that's just all they look at is the profiling on the servers, uh, trying to get uh, the overall time down. Um, there is uh, some, uh, 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 what would I say, um, kind of uh, semi-load shedding you can do. Uh, so not just shed a, an impression entirely, uh, but partially compute uh, what the results uh, look like. You can sort of get error bars on that and decide if it's worth your time to fully uh, score that one or not. Um, but I, I think it's, in my view, there's, um, uh, this one is, is it's pretty fundamental, I think, in, um, in streaming and scoring systems. Uh, sort of where, where's the locus of computation? It's, um, to me, not that dissimilar from the old days of BI, where you even wondered uh, how what should you materialize or pre-materialize in a view uh, versus leave for real-time computation for the user. Uh, so similar in some ways, the, the trade-off there. All right, uh, last question. Yeah, my question is, uh, are the models being trained automatically, or, uh, or they are trained by your data scientists? Yeah, no, the models are trained automatically. No data scientist does any sort of per campaign work, uh, except that um, uh, on top of it all, so there, there's a certain degree of insights and stats that come out of the basic uh, model application uh, and amazing results that come out of that. But sometimes it's not that satisfying as uh, kind of, you know, a story uh, for the customer to say, here's what happened, here's what we've learned. And so we do have data scientists who go beyond uh, just whatever the scoring model learned and try to look at other patterns in the data uh, to surface opportunities on how to do a better job next time. Uh, for example, the one I went by quickly was, was trying to integrate uh, brand-oriented ads, meaning just here's a beautiful car, and uh, sales-oriented ads, which is, you know, this car is $1,000 off, you know, this weekend only. Uh, if you can, uh, you know, uh, integrate those into one campaign, you can do, a, it might be obvious, you can do a really nice job versus running them as if they were entirely independent. And, and the way a lot of marketers do think is that they think these things are different. Uh, and so it's, it's rare for them to capitalize on that opportunity. So that's an example of something that our, our analyst team will do. Thank you very much, John. All right. George.